Okay, so this is the, um, the I, I, from my understanding, the first time we've done an education panel at, at SAIT. Um, and I'm just going to mostly introduce the speakers here. Um, we're going to do it a little differently in that our speakers are going to come up to the podium and do a short presentation on some of their, on some of their work. Um, what I, the inspiration for this was um, there's a lot of excellent uh, institutions out there. We approach similar problems in a different way. Um, not everybody, as I mentioned earlier in this conference, we're not all one-stop shop. There's, a, there's some interesting ways that, we've, that we uh, educate our students and that we uh, work with material and, 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 uh, and some really innovative stuff that's going on in education. So we wanted to kind of present a few different models and some projects that we're working on. Um, this is Carolyn Henney, and Carolyn is, let me get this right, she's the director of our public art program the interim director of our facility for arts research, the chair of the fine arts program, the associate dean for the College of Visual Arts Theater and Dance at FSU, and in her spare time, and this is not, she taught our first class in character plaster at FSU. She's, she's gonna present on that. M.K. Haley, who we all know already, our technology chair, also a professor at FSU and our, a full-time professor at FSU, split with Imagineering for the second half of the year, and uh, our entrepreneur in residence. Um, Shirley Saldemarco, who is a professor at the Interta Entertainment Technology Center at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, pioneered uh, themed entertainment education and entertainment technology education for all the rest of us, so we're really following in the footsteps of what Carnegie Mellon is doing. And Professor James Oliverio, who is the executive director of the Digital Worlds Institute at the University of Florida. And James has done us a great favor today. He's come down to be on this panel, and he flies out right after this up to South Carolina, where his, uh, an orchestra is recording his symphony. So he's done us a big favor to come down here just, just for this panel, too. So I'm not going to waste a lot of time for the committee, so I'll just bring on Carolyn. Thank you. So I was just waiting for the Board of Trustees to approve it. It was College of Visual Arts Theater and Dance, and you guys are the first to see the new pr proposed name. My faculty in the Department of Art were fine with this change. Okay. Um, so as you know, Peter Weishar, um, our dean, who's been at FSU just a little over a year, has forged relationships with... Uh, Walt Disney Imagineering prior to coming to um, FSU, and there are a number of SCAD students here as a result of that program. Uh, I think they're all sleeping right now. No, there they are. Oh, hello. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, so once he got to FSU, he really wanted to figure out a, a great way to um, forge a relationship with FSU and WDI, and by doing something really new and different. And simultaneously, uh, Jolt Horme, who is the creative VP, or a creative VP at uh, Disney Imagineering, was beginning to note that the pipeline for um, art directors in the character finishing uh, world was kind of drying up, and he was, to use this term, they were aging out, and he was having some concerns about what was the future for his part of Imagineering. Uh, so we developed a two-course sequence, and when I say we, um, you can see that we is a big word. There are a lot of people that were really involved in uh, delivering the course content, and then prior to all of that, there was a lot of pre-production um, involved. So we had uh, many, many people at um, WDI um, who got involved in terms of preparing us for um, the course, uh, not only uh, taking the students through, but also training me and Jason Strom, who's teaching the second part of the course sequence. 
Um, so we went there twice, Jason and I did, and then we took the students the second time. So they, w they went through all sorts of demonstrations, they toured us, they advised us on all facets of the course. Additionally, there was a really large group of people back at FSU who were working on the infrastructure for the course and welding things up and sourcing materials and that sort of thing. So it was, it was quite uh, a great effort just to sort of try to replicate what we uh, experienced and saw on the, um, in the sample yard at WDI in Orlando. Uh, the first course was the course that I taught, which was character plaster. Um, since I didn't know what that was until I taught the course, I'll, t I'll tell you what it is. It's, a <laughs> it's the production of hard finishes that m mimic other materials, including rockwork, hardscape, architectural facades, etc. So the students created original works um, using techniques adopted from the research and fabrication me methods that they'd learned about at um, WDI. Um, and this gave them the opportunity to investigate potential for the applications of this uh, strategy, not only for their own work, but also for, to think about real world Disney projects. The second course, which is going on now, um, taught by Jason Strom, who is here, um, is an introduction to character character paint, which is, of course is the painting and faux finishing and texturing of these um, cement elements that were uh, made in this course. So these courses are really good fit for our curriculum in the Department of Art in the School of Theater. Um, so as stated in my bio, um, FSU's Department of Art focuses on producing technologically savvy artists and designers who are con conscientious actors with good hands and students uh, graduate with analytical and critical skills, hand and web skills, design and collaborative skills, and a real conviction and belief in what they do and have to offer. Uh, so, okay, so uh, this was a natural for us to embrace since it has a strong emphasis on research and developing concept, plus learning about new tools and materials by which to communicate those ideas. Um, with the amazing Jolt Horme, providing the introduction to the course at WDI, and then joining the class three more times to do more demos and critiques. Um, it was really a phenomenal class. Uh, the trip to Walt Disney World in January provided exposure uh, to the potential and scale of the materials and the processes. The students met with artists from uh, Walt Disney Imagineering, and these experts led the class in workshops and took the students exploring in Animal Kingdom and they could see in process and completed uh, examples of really large scale um, character plaster projects. Um, so this is Jolt showing the students the Tree of Life. Of course, Jolt was the lead art director on the Tree of Life, so this was extraordinarily exciting for all of us. Um, the students were really blown away um, by being able to examine all of these uh, elements of the Tree of Life um, with the lead sculptor on this project. And so Emma Holbrook is right here, and she was in the class. It was pretty, pretty cool, right? And uh, just FYI, uh, Emma's graduating this semester and looking for other opportunities. Um, uh, so on we go. We also got a chance to see a lot of foam models uh, at WDI and other sorts of examples of what we were going to be doing in the class. So it's really useful throughout the semester because they were they work towards building a fully realized show piece, show you know a show scene based on their research, their reference materials, and their scale models. So seeing all of these elements close up at the very beginning of the course accelerated their understanding of what the course was about, and it got them very very excited. So Jolt um, demonstrated a number of sculpting and texturing techniques. Why were we, the first time we were at WDI, and um, he made it look really easy. So that was great, because it was a little alarming. So this course was also a really good fit for me, because I have, I have worked on a number of films as a, a prop fabricator. I've actually worked for Disney. So this is my, uh, some of the rock work that I did for Disney um, uh, on the Jungle Book. So. Um, the real difference is that I don't get to bring my dog, Ethel, to work when I'm teaching this character plaster class. But other than that, it was very, wasn't a real stretch to teach this course. Um, and then it's just a little more work. Okay. 
So research is a constant activity for an artist, as everybody in this room knows. And um, this, of course, was no different. And we actually went to the library. And I want you to note that that's actually a library book up there. And um, so there we, we did a wide range of, of research. And we had a great research associate working with us who's now working with MK in her class. Uh, so it was a really um, well-developed course. They, they, were, they were getting a lot of support, not only technically, but also in terms of research and depth of research and, and how far their reach could, could go with that. So um, they developed their story. I know I'm not supposed to use that word, but I don't know. I'm not a sophisticated enough to come up with another word. So, um, so they had to determine all sorts of very specific um, elements about their environmental theme. So um, landscape, rocks, trees indigenous to the area, architecture, era, etc. And then they presented uh, their concepts to the class for feedback and then they built uh, one inch scale mech huts. So you can see there's a sample board here from the yard at WDI and we replicated that in our um, outdoor classroom and each student was given a sample board to develop um, their um, sample program or muck up. So I know it's mock up, but Jol whenever Jolt said it sounded like muck up, so I decided that was a better term. Um, so they use this to experiment with techniques that they learned, but also to, to try and figure out how to actually accomplish what they had already determined they needed specifically to do for their um, full-scale project. Uh, so they, they made the one-inch one scale model. Then we decided that they needed to do a, the same model, uh, absorbing a lot of feedback, specifically uh, right after one of Jolt's visits. And we decided they needed to do the same model at, the, at a two-inch scale. There were two reasons for this. One, at one-inch scale, since their pieces weren't the scale of what they had seen, at WDI, at one scale, they had no idea how ambitious their scale models were. So we were trying to talk them down from 11-foot pieces to maybe 6- or 7-foot pieces. But at that scale, it was really difficult for them to see. So we, we had them redo the, do, do it at a 2-inch scale, and that was really helpful. The other piece of it is they really, really were loath to make any changes to uh, their foam uh, model. And so we just made them redo the whole thing. Um, <laughs> so I think, I think eventually they came around to the idea that it's a lot easier to make changes in foam than it is in cement, but at the time it was, there were even tears involved. So, <laughs> but as Jolt has said to them many times, and I quote, this is what we do every day. Cut and cut and cut and cut. So. Uh, he was a great reinforcer when I was kind of the bad guy. Uh, so let's move on. So these are examples of the uh, cage work. On the left-hand side, you can see cage work that we, we saw at WDI. And on the right-hand side, you can see the students uh, building their own and doing their own preparing for their um, cement application. And these are the full-scale versions of the student maquettes. And then, uh, so they were, they were about six foot by six foot by six foot. So there, most of them incorporated some sort of a hardscape as well. And um, these are two more full-scale maquettes uh, situated next to their um, scale models that they have now gone back to this semester and, and started to uh, figure out their color, paint, texture programs so that when they go back to the full-scale models, they're ready to go. Um, okay. And so this semester, Joel's been very involved again. He was here for the beginning of the class along with Colleen Myers, who is a production designer principal at WDI in Orlando. And um, she actually came back, oops, she actually came back last week and did um, a lot more demos with a big emphasis on um, acid staining. Um, and uh, once the students go start on their large scale pieces, she'll be back to give feedback and guidance. So that's, that's where we are with the class. And um, 
This is a happy bunch of people at the beginning of the semester. There, there's also been some crying in my class, and it wasn't me. <laughs> um, so I think you've picked up on a trend here, which is a lot of people with a lot of titles partnering with academia and industry with more people with dual or quadruple roles. And that is really the only way that this is going to work, is that uh, it can't just be I'm a something with a little something on the side. It has to be a commitment from, from everybody in the pipeline here on this is important to us, we're going to commit to it, we're going to make sure that we have folks accessible um, across the entire pipeline. The partnership that we had with, with Jolt uh, starting last spring was super successful. So, uh, and also we have a long trusted relationship with the dean here. So when he came to uh, Imagineering with the proposal of, you know, what's the next step? Well, you know, we had one, one Imagineer come down a few times, partner on a class, both in the curriculum prep and then in the actual execution. What's a logical next step? And the proposal was so simple and so beautiful. The Walt Disney Company is the single largest non-government employer in this state. Entertainment is the single biggest industry in this state. Why don't we have a partnership? And the answer was, uh, okay, <laughs> that is completely logical. Also, on, on the flip side, um, we really struggle. I think all of us struggle with finding the exact right type of talent. We could have thousands of resumes in our database, but it doesn't reflect what do people do with their hands? What do you make or sell? What expertise do you have? And who can you work with on either side of you? Because it's, it's very much a cooperative sort of arrangement. So uh, right this minute, those are my business cards. Um, but it's, it is absolutely not a linear thing. I don't do something for 20 weeks and something else for 32 weeks a year. It's very interconnected. That is my universe. And it's not only an issue of working with the Walt Disney Company, a, a dual role with Florida State, it's those other associations. I'm still adjunct faculty with Shirley at the Entertainment Technology Center uh, in Pittsburgh. I serve on the board of directors for ACM SIGGRAPH and have for uh, 28 years. Um, I'm very involved in uh, the TEA, obviously. And these things all interconnect. Um, as a joke, I was loading up my Mini Cooper and driving cross country to come here to fall. Uh, Patrick Brennan said, no, you're not going to like leave and go to FSU forever for goods, right? Like full time. And I was like, no, like, here's, don't listen. Here's the secret. My value to FSU is that I work at Disney and my value to Disney is my connection to FSU. Like this interconnection is very specifically the unique value I add. So I can't mess up any of my triad. <laughs> and so what I do is entrepreneur in residence, which is a new program that Florida State has put on. Each college has their own. I think we have five or six so far. Other colleges are yet to pick them up. What's great is I don't report to a department. I report to a college and I have um, purview and access to people all over the university. And that, just those walls going down is delightful. Everybody likes these ideas, right? It's a no-brainer to get people to collaborate. It's actually really hard. It's non-trivial for a chemistry student to take an art class. Because how do the tuition dollars get allocated? Is the credit hours the same? So. Administratively, it took us about nine and a half months to figure out how this would work. I talked to Peter on Thanksgiving week last year, and it was August before we actually, at all sides, agreed to make this work. So aside from teaching classes, that's my, my faculty box on, on themed entertainment um, and, and similar things, also anyone in the university is welcome to work with me. There's two students in the art history department doing some really interesting projects related to Disney from an art history point of view. And, you know, in three-hour work sessions, they got more information and contacts about what are the proper next steps than they could ever have gotten without me in the office next door. And I'm like, oh, yeah, this is the woman who runs the light. Let's just, let's just give her a ring. Like, it's that easy when I have a phone book <laughs> and other students aren't exactly sure, like, do we talk to legal first? Do we talk to PR first? So, so it was really fun that I've only been there five or six weeks. The response was, cool, how can we work together? I was worried that it would be, you corporate shill, what are you shoving down our throats? Absolutely not. Like, it has been from students to faculty, staff, and administration. Um, people pop in my office all the time. It's been a really beautiful relationship. Um, also, selfishly, I have privileged access to students. Imaginations is a student design competition that Imagineering runs. Students can plop in my office and say, let's talk about this. How do we succeed in this? Um, and then I recuse myself from judging it, it at the end of the day. Um, and also, 
It's Peter's job to make sure that our donors and our investors are excited about where we're going in the future, where we are right now, and where we're going in the future. So sitting and talking to these folks about his plans and his vision and putting his money where his mouth is, you know, bringing in uh, expertise, bringing in guest speakers and faculty uh, has, also been, uh, has also been really fun. Because at Disney, we don't actually have many donors. So that, that's a unique relationship. And other faculty members are really fun, have come up and said, hey, can you talk to my students? I, one of your students told me about a lecture you gave. Can you come give that to me? I said, sure. Uh, so so that, that sort of cross-disciplinary collaboration, which is so easy, has been, has been really fun. Um, where the tears were, um, I, I do a lecture on best practices for personal and professional presentation. And the student's like, why are you, why are you, why is that any of your beeswax? Um, and the answer is it's my job to teach you soup to nuts, not just the skill set and the craft, but also how to succeed. They have to present in public in a multitude of forms. They have to work on groups. Um, and I had one student who refused to do it, so in case you get zero credit on that. And the, they had a resume, a LinkedIn profile, and a portfolio, if their discipline called for it, were due by midnight. And then we had a workshop the next day. And she said, did you literally see me sinking in my seat? She's like, I'm such a moron. Like, I had no, and I'm like, oh, okay, good. I guess that was the point. <laughs> you realize that there's value in this. The next project, I had three grad students pull together teams of 10 from those resumes. So guess what? There's, there's consequences, too. When we ask you to do something, it's for a reason. And if you didn't do it or you didn't do it well, you were kind of last picked. Um, and then also, I gave the workshop on a Tuesday, on Thursday. Three haircuts. So I was, I was pretty pleased that everyone spiffed themselves up a, a little bit uh, and, and raised, the, raised the level of their game. So what are next steps? Um, uh, Peter has a very well thought out set of milestones and plans. H how do we first of all quantify what we're doing? How do we communicate it and scale it? So at a very high level, the vision is the idea of a center for environmental storytelling. And as we dig into that, we realize that center means something specific at Florida State. So we're not going to use that word. Um, but that's until you start pulling together an idea and start you know, hanging things on your framework, those are the things that you don't figure out. And the idea is taking this aggregate of expertise, resources. We have that amazing facility where we can do concrete work. We have an amazing theater with a shop. We have a brilliant mechanical engineering and robotics group. How do you have them work together to build what we do every single day um, in universities and universities that are usually so siloed? And so how do you move forward to something that is a thing, and then how do you scale that across other campuses, across other universities? How do you become a model that others can uh, learn from? So uh, it's a little ambitious, it's terrifying, but it is ridiculously fun. It is so it is so neat to have these conversations freely happening back and forth that may have not. And by the end of the semester, I'm going to go for tear free, cry free on finals exam. <laughs> so, and next up we have Shirley Saldemarco from the Entertainment Technology Center at Carnegie Mellon. How's everybody doing? I, I, good. You know, I have to, real quick, I have to say this. I was so worried that projection wouldn't be working, and I don't have the guns that Denise has. I thought, oh, what am I going to do? So it's all good. It's all great. I, I'm just really excited to be here because I always like talking about the ETC and our amazing, talented students. And yes, I know I'm biased. I'm absolutely biased when it comes to them, but they're really amazing, trust me. So the ETC is celebrating its 15th birthday, and it's really hard to believe that we've been around that long already. As I look back over the last 15 years, I realize just how much the industry has changed, uh, and, and the, the presentations we've been hearing yesterday and today, it proves that. It's really changed significantly the last 15 years. Academic institutions have definitely changed. And you know what? Up, oh, how's it? What's going on? There we go. We have changed as well, right? <laughs> Over the last 15 years. Don't laugh. There. Um, but change is good, right? We're not saying it's good or bad, but change can really be very, very good. The two men that founded the ETC could probably not be more different in every way you can imagine. For us, it was the collision, you know, when worlds collide, it was really the collision of 
the comet and the tornado, otherwise known as Randy Pausch, computer scientist and author of the last lecture, and Don Marinelli, who's a creative visionary and professor of drama. But although they were really very different in the way they thought, the way they looked, the way they dressed, you name it, um, one thing they totally agreed on was that we really had a need for an educational experience that would be proactively responsive to the needs of the changing and growing entertainment industry. So now all they had to do was figure out what is that and how are we going to do it? So that should be no problem, right? Well, what they did was go on this kind of world tour talking to people all over the industry, all different types of folks. One of them who really, and what they were asking was, what do you want in an employee? What would make the best employee? How can we help craft that person so they walk out of our doors, into your doors, absolutely perfectly? And they talked to Ed Catmull, who was chief Techno technology officer at Pixar at the time. And he said, I have some of the most talented designers, artists, animators, you name it, working for me. The problem is they don't always know how to work with one another. And so in developing the ETC, there wasn't going to be the standard academic model of a curriculum that was just loaded down with all kinds of required courses, even though that's the background from which Dawn and Randy both came. Instead, there was going to be what we called an immersive semester. That's kind of boot camp for first-year graduate students. And that's where the students would learn a kind of baptism by fire of rapid prototyping, storytelling, and most importantly, teamwork. Because, boy, that was really at the bottom of it. And MK touched on this. Teamwork is a different difficult concept, maybe not just for students, but especially for them. It was a tough thing. So from day one, they're put on small teams. In boot camp, it's four people on a single team. Every two weeks, that rotates. They put out a new prototype, change teams, do it all over again for the entire semester. And then for the remaining three semesters, they work on projects. And again, they're assigned to teams, usually four to six people, once in a while, it's eight people, but mostly it's four to six. It just depends on what the project needs are. And so the, the teams are made up of programmers, on artists, and designers, and they're all led by a producer. Because they're expected to work in these project rooms for between 25 and 35 hours a week, we try to make it a little bit comfortable for them. So their desk, computers, conference table, it's all put in there. We try to add some amenities, like a sofa, a little refrigerator. There's no reason for them to ever leave. And <laughs> sometimes they try not to, because there's a shower downstairs in the lobby. But we do encourage them, get out of here. You know, you cannot stay the whole time. Um, but it's really uh, important to realize, and, and this comes to them eventually, that the teams who spend the most time together working as a, as a team, not five individuals sitting in that same classroom, or <gasps> classroom, project room. They don't have classrooms. But th the students who really invest all of that time are the ones that have the most creative projects, who have the highest quality of whatever end up, th they end up delivering. And I think it's a small. Um, a small epiphany that comes because they don't believe it at first. You know, oh, we don't have to work together. No, no, I can do this. I'll phone it in. It'll be, it'll be fine. No, nah, it's not fine. Um, it, they have to work on the model the way we developed it, a specific project for a particular client, and they have to deliver a working prototype. And here, this is the real big punchline, in 15 weeks. To me, that's the amazing part of it. Being able to get these students, you know, helping them, teaching them, and, and develop that ability to collaborate and function as a team within a rapid prototyping model, that's what we think is the secret sauce of the ETC. As a matter of fact, over the last four years, 
we were the subject of a kind of internal investigation. It was a research project by a Dr. Laurie Weingart, who is from Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School, the business school. And her goal was to explore if more disciplinary diverse teams, those you know, made up of artists, programmers, designers, create more innovative work. That's what we were all about, so of course, we wanted to know. What she discovered was the more expertise diversity led to more conflict, more disagreement, and more debate. Oh, wow. Is this a problem? Because that's what we're all about. But in the ETC, although it didn't usually come to, usually, come to fisticuffs and throwing things, um, what we did find out that the students on the, on the teams would act, and this is what the, the uh, research project actually reported back, not just what we knew, but the students with all this diversity ended up having higher quality and more innovative final deliverables. So all the conflict, the comp, you know, the, all of the arguments, the disagreements, that was actually a good thing because they listened to what each other, what they had to say, and they weighed it out. And it, it was really a, kind of a, a validation of the model where we pull out all of the, uh, the, the personal ego, this individual ego, and replace it with collaboration and compromise, getting them to realize you've got to respect the people you work with. You have to listen to their ideas, too. And, once they realized that, it, it was just smoother workings within the teams. It's all about how creativity inspires technology, and technology inspires creativity. Not my words, I stole them from Ed Catmull, too. It all eventually leads back to that, though, doesn't it? To creativity, and yet I think all of us in this room, and I hope you say yes, because I feel this way, it's kind of scary being called a creative person because we don't really know where our last creative idea came from. We're wondering, where are we going to get the next one? And then there's that little nagging thing, are we ever going to have another creative idea ever again? And so at the ETC, we try to encourage the students to overcome that apprehension by fostering this fearless experimentation, the whole dare to go where no one has gone before. Because most people believe that life is about success, right? It's, it should be about success. But the truth is, it should also be about those glorious failures. But that's a really, really tough creed to get the students to, to go along with. So here's how we try to get them to buy into that concept. It's the glorious failure is what is at the root of the ETC's first Penguin Award. It comes from that notion that, you know, at some point the penguins have to jump into the water. And that water is either going to be okay or it's going to be filled with predators. But somebody's got to be the first one to jump. So the penguins line up on that glacier, and they just kind of stand there shifting from foot to foot, you know, and saying, no, you go, no, no, you go, you go, until one brave penguin jumps in the water, and he starts swimming, or she, starts swimming for their life so that they are not somebody's lunch. And once that happens, everybody else starts jumping into the water, and then they all swim like crazy to get to the safer waters. And sometimes they make it, and sometimes they're just lunch. Uh, but unless they jump in, <laughs> but if you don't jump in, you never get to succeed. So, you know, you have to try. And we tell the students that you got to get rid of that failure is not an option mindset because you have to try. You have to go out there and experiment. So we have to be careful we're not taking this a little too far because now there are the teams that are going, Oh yeah, we failed. We, our, our project didn't make it. This is terrific. We got the Penguin Award. But, but the, they jokingly say that. Right guys? You just joke about that when you say that? They, they really do prefer to succeed. But it's really great because they've learned something. If they've gone in there and they've tried and pushed the limits, but darn, that just really isn't possible. 
then they learn that. So I, I think it's really great. We have to give ourselves permission to dream. And if we fail, so what? As long as we learn something. So as we wrap it up, I want to talk about um, one of my favorite projects. But they're all my favorite projects, only they're here today. Um, it's a location-based project that an ETC team is working on this semester. It's called Infinity. And their client is the Elizabeth Forward School District. The goal for our team is to transform an ordinary classroom into an interactive, th this is a middle school too, an interactive energy lab that can then be replicated throughout the country. But the lab has to be more than just a supplement to the curriculum. It has to become a destination where students want to go to learn and to share and just hang out. Try to make this a place where they want to share their learning, their information, everything that they know and could possibly want to know about energy. The larger challenge, though, for this project is that it lasts four semesters. It covers four semesters. So the project team that's working on it right now never gets to see the end product. And yet, their job is to visualize the framework for the entire project and create their part of it without putting any kind of creative or technical limitations on the three teams that are going to follow them. That's a pretty big order because they have to do all of that again 15 weeks. And they have to make sure that they fill in you know, all of those uh, the end pieces. So in order to start to develop the scope and see, you know, how are we going to go about this? What do we need to do? They met with the school administrators and teachers, and they found things out like, well, they could use iPads and build projection systems and work with um, Connect. But the team said, you know, they felt that they had to go even further to get to the real root of the, the project, the, the answer the question, why are we doing this? And so to get to that, they interviewed loads of the students, the end users, right? The kids in the middle school who would be using the energy lab. And Casey Ging, who's the designer and 2D and 3D artist on the team, said it was a conversation with one of the students, a, a young man named Noah, who told them all about this very simple webcam-based game that he created in school and then shared out with his friends. And now Noah, who's in fifth grade, wants to be a computer programmer. It's pretty cool. So Casey said it was this conversation that made the team realize that the students at Elizabeth Forward were learning through inspiration. And the inspiration was coming from one another. And these are just little middle school children. They, they love to build, they love to share, they love to show off what they can do. And the concept that they, uh, they're being nurtured at Elizabeth Forward, but it, it, they're kind of finding this out for themselves. It's the same concept that we use at the ETC. And so the ETC team decided to retool their design strategy around the ideas that the students can learn just as much from one another as they can from anywhere else. So they decided to create an iPad app that will tie all of the experiences together, no matter which student creates them or when they build them, and compile this all together. So the oversimplified explanation is that through the app, the students will utilize various energy sources to fuel a virtual world and then be able to track their progress. They'll be able to quickly upload content from from YouTube and, uh, you know, other uh, websites, that kind of thing. And the teacher then can be the moderator and explain to them how the content is actually related, why it's important, and she can just sort all of that out with them. So th the overall goal of the lab is to give the students a sense of ownership so that by reflecting their shared content in the lab, they they've got this self-pride of, look what I did. See how great this is? And the students are then rewarded with benefits for their virtual world for sharing the information that's out there for everybody else to see. So they get the benefit of you being able to see what they did and how 
cool is that? This is really great. And then their virtual world gets some benefits, so they get to play the game part of it a, a little bit better. And the Infinity team is calling this class-sourced education. I don't know if they made that up, but I thought that was pretty nice. So Casey and Lisa Elkins, the producer for the team, are both uh, TEA Next Gen members, and they're both here in the audience. Where are you two? Where are you sitting? Put your hand up. Are you out there? Okay. Because I think they would love to talk to you more about the details of their project, and I know they're already talking to folks from Christie about the projection. So they're, they're already kind of picking your brain about things. So just in closing, I, I'd like... We, we, kind of come full circle. When Peter opened the session, seems like a long time ago, but it was just yesterday morning, but he talked about how both Walt Disney and John Ringling just embraced the characteristic, characteristics of risk-taking and dreams and, and teamwork. And like them, the ETC is all about turning dreams into reality. Randy and Dawn used to call the ETC the Dream Fulfillment Factory. And I, is it there? Yeah, there's a Dream Fulfillment Factory. I, and I can't think of a better way to explain a place where the dreams of students and faculty and sponsor partners are all encouraged and fostered and fulfilled. So I'm very proud of my ETC and my very talented students. Thank you very much. All right. Well, I'm very pleased to be here for the first time with you. I'm excited and energized by the time that I got to spend yesterday afternoon with a very few of you, but about the vision and the diversity of the membership of this group for me is, is a wonderful thing, and I'm really happy that I could share a little bit about the program that um, I've had the pleasure of being the founding <coughs> director for at the University of Florida since 2001. Uh, before I came to UF, as we call the University of Florida, which is a research institution, uh, not unlike Florida State University, one of our collegial um, partners in educating the youth of not only the state of Florida, but increasingly the country and the world. Um, as research institutions that are publicly funded, we have a mandate to serve the public uh, in a way that may be different than some private institutions. So I always try to keep that in mind. Previously, I was the, the artist uh, at Georgia Tech as I finally like to say, a small trade school on Atlanta. It was originally called the North Avenue Trade School back in the 1800s. But in the 90s, I was the artist in residence at Georgia Tech. All of my peers were scientists and engineers. Um, and I learned a lot about the, the mindset of scientists and engineers. So when I was able to found the Digital Worlds Institute, um, the mission statement itself has got all the boilerplate that we need, but it was really about collaboration between different types of people. Um, and as our colleagues here have indicated, that's where we find true advancement when we bring people woven from different cloths together to make a new tapestry. And uh, we've been very pleased to be able to do that. At the University of Florida, we have uh, 16 colleges, and as a result of that, some of which are bigger than Georgia Tech, so 16 colleges at the University of Florida. So we have a real diversity of uh, talent from different fields to draw on, and at Digital Worlds, we routinely work across these fields. Um, and it, uh, more recently, even in the digital humanities, which is an area that folks from the classics read Greek and Roman, are now looking at ways in which our new technologies can both empower and inspire in the same way that some of the traditional stories throughout the ages have become classics. So we're very pleased to be able to uh, work with people, including anthropologists, in the work that we're doing. Um, some of my work at Georgia Tech, uh, I actually work with folks in usability which was an emerging field in computer science in the late 20th century. And one of the things that we often said was the interface defines the experience. If you've only got a hammer, there, you know, there's not a whole lot of things you can do with it unless it's a deluxe hammer, you can actually take out the nail that you just pounded in. 
okay, so that's the interface between you and what you're working on. So what I was really keen on doing was expanding the notion of interface. When I came down to UF uh, in a small town called Gainesville with about 50 some thousand students, um, was take an old gymnasium built around 1930 and through some adaptive reuse and about 1.8 million dollars that we were able to raise, turn it into our space which we call the research, education and visualization environment or the REV. If you speak French you know that refers to a, a dream since we're doing a lot of work with large-scale virtual environments. So this is our classroom in 2003 and a fly-through that we made that very year to celebrate the 150th anniversary of UF on a machine that was called an SGI which is about as big as a large refrigerator in those days. Um, and this room we call it the polymodal immersive classroom theater. So this is the space, one of them, in the old gymnasium that we created. And then the actual presentation that we created uh, tells the story of UF. And these are actual composites from various generations that have gone there. And funnily enough, uh, the actual name for this presentation that we created to celebrate UF's 150 was Dream Machine. They actually, uh, the president called UF as a whole a dream machine for folks. So the notion of dreams and actually helping to put it out there was one that's common across our programs. Um, and then this is what the, the PIC, the Polymodal Immersive Classroom Theater, looks like today. Um, we've added theater seating and now we can navigate through the data with a laser pointer of our own design on the walls and it pulls data right from our website. We update our website, it's on this thing, which is what we call our worldwide wall. So this is one of the environments that we're using now. We were asked by the Center for Neuro Restoration and Movement Disorders to design, help design their waiting room. People with Parkinson's and other movement disorders come from around the world to this location and because they knew about our work in displays, we designed the immersive uh, environment in that theater, well not that theater, that waiting room, and they say routinely that their patients have the highest satisfaction rating of any of the clinics at the University of Florida because their waiting room is not Fox News tonight, 47 people were killed, blah, 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 and you're going in there about to be told that you have Parkinson's or dystonia. So again, the interface, the environment as an interface, if we're going to be uh, teaching and having people work together, the space they work in is very important. Some of the seminal work we did at Georgia Tech in the 90s with engineers, that's uh, early motion capture on the green screen with a tether. We were taking dancers on one side of the campus and over the high-speed network forming uh, images from a painting that was behind the dancers and they would come alive through real-time animation running on those old-time SGI machines. By 2005 at Digital Worlds we were invited to SIGGRAPH and we extended that concept of a cross-campus high-speed network to seven cities across all five inhabited continents. This piece was called In Common Time and we had all those people from all around the world engaging in real-time musical, synchronous musical activity as an example of what we can do with large large globally distributed environments. I believe these kind of systems ought to be in every classroom in the world. Then all the young kids would learn about each other from each other in real time and it would not be such, well they and them or us and them. So again, this is part of what we believe is the interface of the classroom is important. By 2010 we went to Vancouver for the International Digital Media and Arts Association and it extended the environments from all video based live performances we were capturing real-time wireless, markerless mocap by a partner of ours in New York, Organic Motion, and in four cities, Tokyo, New York, Gainesville, Florida, and Vancouver simultaneously, dancers like this in one of the mocap cages were put into a shared Cartesian space, virtual space, all of them together, where they danced, performed in surround sound, etc. Again, this is a research project, but our students are working side by side with programmers and artists, dancers, performers, directors, media folks to create these kinds of things. So this is part of the projects. Uh, in the New World School of the Arts, which is a conservatory in Miami, we partnered with them to produce a piece that I called Icons of Innovation that paid tribute to the men and women across the ages that were polymaths, innovators in their own time, a lot of which weren't known by our, our students. So, for example, we, we had two scenarios, one in which uh, Gutenberg and da Vinci, what would happen if they were to meet Jobs and Einstein? And another, Bach and his wife 
Anna Magdalena, well, what if Bach met Frank Zappa and, God forbid, Lady Gaga? So in two, two locations across a high-speed network, UF and Miami, we had dancers and thespians, performers, and then we sent them through a game engine with some special software that we wrote so that at each location, the audiences, and there were four audiences in Chile, South America, in Salt Lake City, in Gainesville and in Miami, and all of them could vote for which pairs of people they wanted to meet on custom software that was written by one of our students, and that little thing with the names of the air airports, Gainesville, Miami, etc. they had one minute whenever they saw the astrolabe to choose which ones they wanted. The performers would then get the data in real time and go out and offer that to them as a real-time feedback, and then, of course, the audience would vote at the end of the performance, and this is what happened. Gutenberg eventually won. Uh, over here we have Jobs giving Gutenberg an iPhone, you know, and over here uh, Thomas Edison dancing with Marie Curie. And so this was an example of both a media, a live performing arts project using the network in an environment that extended gameplay to live performers. We continue with our digital convergence series, which purposefully brings people from around the world, divergent cultures together in real time in sort of a talk show format that people from around the world can ask questions after the performers often our professors at the university, who physics guy that plays the cello. We bring him on the show, talk a little bit about physics, and then he plays his cello, and then people ask him questions. So this is a series that we've done. We're also in the game space. We have our serious and applied gaming environments, or our SAGE program. We recently finished two National Science Foundation uh, awards, one of which was to teach middle school students about the scale of things, down to the nano, which makes these things possible. And uh, we work with a nanoscientist at UF to come up with a, a game that now in middle school classrooms, the teacher without any coding experience can determine how many of the questions the kids need to get right at each level from planetary to nano to go on to uh, learn the, the subject matter. And then gaming against plagiarism, the gap game, was meant to teach kids about intellectual property. Imagine that intellectual property in the digital age. And of course, they have three small games to learn about this instead of the dreadful PowerPoint that the university gives them and says, OK, learn this and don't screw up. Otherwise, we'll get you out of here if you plagiarize or otherwise use somebody else's property. So that's being used by a number of institutions around the country now. So our graduate degree, our MA in Digital Arts and Sciences, has been the one that most of these projects that I've just showed you have been undertaken by. And recently, we've started a BA in DAS, which we affectionately call our badass program. <laughs> so the badass program, uh, just like the MA, allows our students now the resources of the entire university. We've had kids come in from anthropology, from religion, from other areas. Uh, journalism, communications, computer science, visual arts, performing arts, and again, working in collaborative, interdisciplinary teams, they're given things to do. And so, so far, we've actually rolled out the badass program this semester, both online, synchronous online, building upon the stuff that I showed you earlier about our expertise in bringing, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 people together from around the world synchronously. So we have 25 students in our new classroom, which we call the online on-campus research classroom, the ORC. In the ORC, 25 students live and 10 or 15 synchronously live, form a community, work on projects together, and then those that can't join live because they've got to take care of grandma or whatever can join on their own time but still be part of a synchronous semester by semester experience. So I think that's pretty much an overview of the stuff we're doing. This is a couple shots from our classroom and our SAGE environment. All three of these are on the L shape, are in our picked environment, a game festival, uh, live vibe TV with a physicist talking about some stuff, and then uh, Scott with a uh, Manhattan skyline in the, in the visualization space there, and then in our SAGE, our lab where the kids are working on some environment, um, gaming environments, and then finally, in the old gymnasium, we were just able to renovate the downstairs, which was the shower and locker room again, in a building built in the 1930s. But now we've got a, a workspace where our folks can work with light coming in, and we continue to work with students in areas ranging from dance and theater to communications, journalism, um, media, and game design. So that's my dog and pony. Thank you.
MK is just informing me we have eight minutes for Q&A, so maybe that's one or two questions. If you could bring up the house light and I see a couple of hands. So when students enter this, like these collaborative environments that you guys have all made, is it assumed that each student entering the environment or like taking the class or entering the sequence has uh, like a specific skill? Like is it assumed that, oh, this person is good at illustration or this person is good at, um, at like whatever, or is there room for someone who doesn't know exactly what they want to do to find their niche and find that place on a team? Well, it, it might be different at all of the academic institutions, but at the ETC, we always say that that's not the place to come. If you're an animator, don't come there to become an artist, a, a programmer. And if you're a programmer, don't think you're going to become an artist there because that's not what we do. The, the makeup of the ETC is about 40% computer scientist, 40% artist, and 20%, you coined this? Random awesomeness. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that works, but we, we don't train, we expect them to come. It's a graduate program with a level of expertise, and then we hope that they hone that, develop it, and maybe be able to pick up a little bit, but you know they're not going to become animators if they were programmers when they walked in the door. Yeah, in our program, uh, the badass, which is the undergraduate students, this is actually the junior and senior year of a four-year program. So by definition, they come from diverse backgrounds. We don't expect them all to be woven from the same cloth, but we do have a portfolio submission. Um, that they, you know, demonstrate what they can do, and we try to balance that out among the different um, flavors, I call them. At a graduate degree, um, similar to what Shirley was saying, that we, we're not going to make someone into something that they hadn't already had experience in at the undergraduate. That being said, we develop their fluency to work with people who are not acting and looking like them, so to speak, so that they can be successful at innovative and collaborative work. Any other questions out there? Yeah, um, I know yesterday we, we spoke a lot about storytelling and architecture. Uh, today I, I was specifically to Carolyn, you were, your class for the plaster. I was very much liked to, that, that we're seeing the implementation of the storytelling um, in that way. My, my question is, um, Tying that storytelling where you have the students do a maquette and then later on do a full-scale uh, representation of the maquette, to tie back into the architecture and the bigger picture uh, of that storytelling, does your program now or is it planning on doing anything where we are taking that storytelling and understanding the infrastructure behind that and, and the infrastructure and the architecture where we, we want to look at the rebar cages and the engineering side behind that and where we can take a maquette, scan it in, take it into a digital format where we can involve that in BIM modeling for conflict resolution or clearances for uh, rides in, in the application of a theme park attraction. Uh, is there a fill-in for that section of education uh, for not just the art but also the architecture of that art? Well, I can answer in that they do understand how Disney actually does it, as opposed to our pretty hands-on, you know, we were actually welding and, uh, and tying with tie wire the, the uh, lab onto the, you know, that doesn't happen at Disney. And so that was all uh, explained to them and shown to them how, th how that all works. Um, so it's much more sophisticated and digitally driven than what we did. Um, what is exactly what Disney does is, is the actual um, sculpting and the, and the painting. Uh, that's still just a hands-on um, activity. As far as expanding the program, I think maybe Peter can address that. Um, we do plan on doing uh, more and more with the class. This was the first time we taught it. Um, we, we plan on offering that as a sequence of character 
plaster and paint. As we get more sophisticated in how we're doing it and redevelop the class, there, there's a possibility of, of bringing in uh, more of the architectural concepts you were talking about. Right, and, and you know, uh, Jolt is really hopeful that some of the students in these classes is, are going to move on into either employment or an internship um, at WDI where they would become more uh, conversant in, in the actual ways of Disney. Boss says we're done. Th thank you. Thank you very much, panelists. <laughs> thank you to now. I, I'm just gonna. I got a lot of mics. Uh, special thanks to Peter for suggesting and helping uh, coordinate that for us. Uh, this concludes our tech track uh, section, the T of your state. Uh, special thanks obviously to all of our panelists who come and spoke, prepared really very specific things to impart wisdom and both discuss in front of us all what are the future opportunities and needs for, for the industry that we have here. Um, I would like a special thank you to the dodgy microphones and countdown timer that doesn't work to remind us we rely on technology and we miss it when it's not there. Um, <laughs> So this afternoon, we'll be enjoying the experience portion of our E of our state. Uh, we have lunch from 1 to 2.30. It is outside. It is number 11 on your map here. Um, there are volunteers who, of course, direct you to this, but we're in a, the lovely Loge Garden area outside the galleries. Um, we have our fearless leaders here to segue us into the next portion of the afternoon. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>